This morning I want to uh, uh, look at the parable of the Good Samaritan. And this is found in Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37, which we've already read uh, uh, in, the, in the worship service. If you are, are watching this and, and you want to follow along, then, then that's where you'll find the scripture, uh, uh, Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. Um, we have also read uh, in conjunction with that Acts uh, 26 verses 24 through 30. Uh, if you'd like to uh, uh, to have that for an insight into into what we'll talk about uh, this morning, uh, as we look at this parable of the Good Samaritan, I wish that I could offer up to you uh, some new lesson in this, some new meaning that nobody else has has ever discovered before. But it really is a, a straightforward. Uh, a parable. Uh, a lawyer, uh, an expert in the law, asked Jesus how to inherit eternal life. And uh, Jesus answers him in a, in a straightforward way. In, in verse 27, uh, Jesus says, You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your strength and with all of your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And, and this is, this is a, a straightforward answer. The, the lawyer wants clarification, as uh, probably uh, experts in the law uh, still are wont to do. And he asks Jesus, well, who is my neighbor? Uh, who is it that I have to love? You know, uh, the implication here is that I, I can do all those other things, but, but I want to know who my neighbor is so that I can, I can know who exactly it is that that I'm supposed to love, and Jesus answers with this parable. And it kind of goes like this. How do, I, how do I have eternal life? Well, to, you have eternal life by, uh, by loving God with all of your heart, your mind, your body, your soul, and your soul, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, and, and who is my neighbor then, Jesus? Well, anyone and everyone who is in need without bigotry or bias. This is the parable. Anyone who, and, and, and who is in need without bigotry and without bias to who they all people are your neighbor. And so you've got to love them all. Amen. We can go on. The service is done. That's my sermon. <laughs> because that's the meaning of the parable. Well, that's fine, but maybe we can move forward anyway. Uh, certainly this is the overall message of the parable. But I think that there is more to it that's also valuable and worth some thought. In other words, I don't want to negate the idea that, that, that how do I inherit eternal life? Well, I love God with all of my heart, my mind, my body, my soul. I, I, I love my neighbor as myself. Who is my neighbor? My neighbor is everybody. It's not just the people that that uh, that I like is not the people that are just my my literal neighbor who uh, spatially. Uh, it is all people, even people I don't like. They're still my neighbor. And and how do I etern uh, inherit eternal life? Well, I love them. I'm not going to negate that message, but I think that there is there is some uh, something else that we that we need to that we need to think about here. Uh, something else that is valuable, and that something else comes to light when we. Uh, when we ask a, a couple different questions, why would Jesus be so specific about a priest, a Levite, and a Samaritan? Why would he be specific about that? In, in his parable, telling a story, he says, a priest, a Levite, and a Samaritan, and, and uh, uh, the identity of the, of the person who's been beaten and the identity of the robbers, that's, that's nebulous. It's not, it's not uh, specific. Uh, but these three people are specific. What is it about them? What is it about the, the priest who is, for example, a powerful and influential person in the religious life of the community? Not only is, is a priest uh, 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 an influ influential and big part of the life of, of the, uh, uh, the people who are, are Jews in that, in that time period, that, that priest is also uh, very influential in the political aspect of of life for the Jews. This, this person is powerful and influential not only in religion but also in politics. Jesus names the priest. The Levite, sort of a, a lay person who had a very high religious status as well. As well. We could, we could, I'm not going to take the time to go, um, go back and, and look at, at where the Levites came from and who the Levites were and who they became in this time, uh, this period of time, but it is to say that the Levites were, 
were, were lay people who had specific jobs within the temple, they were also important to specifically the religious life of the Jews. Jesus says, a priest, a Levite, and then a Samaritan. Samaritans were hated. Samaritans in general were seen as, uh, as foreigners. They were, they were avoided by the Jews. Uh, they didn't want to have anything to do with them. Uh, uh, they, were, they, were, they were not a part of a recognized part of the, of the Jewish religion of Judaism at all. They, 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 they were, were not seen as people who even had value to the Jews. They, they were antagonistic to one another. A priest, a Levite, and a Samaritan. So this morning I want to think about I want to think about that. I want to think about, you know, certainly we have the, we understand what this parable is about, but, but why? Why these people? And, and specifically, I don't even want to really think too much about the Good Samaritan. What I want to think about are the other two. I want to think about the priest and a Levite, not, not necessarily just because they're a priest and a Levite, but because these are people that, that were almost the Good Samaritan. They had the same opportunity as the Good Samaritan. They, 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 they did the same things. They, 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 the person was laying on the, on the ground and, and they had an opportunity to help that person, but they both walked by. They were both exemplified as almost good Samaritans. I think the implications of this are enormous. Remember that the initial question that the expert of the law asks is how do I inherit eternal law? And with the last part of the answer, uh, Jesus highlights uh, uh, the idea of loving one's neighbor in this parable. Jesus says, this is how you inherit eternal life. And the priest and the Levite almost, almost, got it. When I was growing up, we had a little saying. That saying was that, that almost only counts in horseshoes and hand grenades. Now, uh, I'm willing to. I'm willing to add. Uh, I've seen people uh, recently playing a game uh, that's a beanbag toss game, and so I'm willing to add that in there too. That almost only only counts in horseshoes, hand grenades, and and the beanbag toss game. Uh, if you want to add that in there, it's it's almost only counts in those. In our scripture lesson from Acts, Agrippa is almost talked into Christianity. In this parable, the priest and a Levite almost get it right. Agrippa walks away. The Levite and the, and the, and the priest walk past. They almost get it. But they don't. The Samaritan shows us that almost... Misses the mark. So what causes the almost Samaritan? There were uh, sociologists, uh, social psychologists, I'm sorry. Uh, their names were Daly and Batson. They were doing research on how and why people help each other. Uh, and so in doing their research, they went to Princeton Theological Seminary and they found 67 uh, seminary students who would participate in an experiment. Individually, each, each student was told that they were to give a presentation in another building on campus. Some of, those, some of those students were told that they were late and needed to get right there. Some of those students were told that they were, if they left you know, at a reasonable time, they were on time and they could, they could make their way to give their presentation uh, in an orderly fashion because they were on time. And some of those students were, were told that, uh, uh, that they, were, uh, 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 they were early. They had lots of time. They could do whatever they wanted. They, they, were, they were early as far as they weren't pressed to be there um, um, quickly. Each participant was given a specific route to follow to get to the building where they were to give, to, to give their uh, presentation. And along that route, and they were given a little map they could get from one building to another. Along that route, there was uh, a person who was a confederate in the experiment, somebody who was planted along the way. This person who was planted along the way was planted in a door. That person's job was to be slumped over in the doorway, moaning loudly and coughing. And well, there was no mistake that there was something really wrong with this person slumped over in the doorway, moaning and coughing. And, and the person was placed right on the route that these, these seminarians were going to take to go and give their presentation. 
This was a modern day version of the parable of the Good Samaritan. In fact, some of those seminarians were going to give their presentation, they were told, on the parable of the Good Samaritan. After all was said and done, here is how this broke down. In this study, in this experiment, they found that of the people that were told they were early, 37% of them still walked by the person slumped over in the doorway. Of those people who were told that they were on time, 55% of those people still walked by the person slumped in the doorway. Of those who were told that they were late, 90% of those people walked by the person slumped in the doorway. Imagine that. Students, seminary students, uh, familiar with this parable, still they're, they're pressed for time and they walk by the stranger in need. Some of them even, even going on their way to, to go and expound on the parable of the Good Samaritan. Still were too busy to stop and apply that in their own lives. It was a time that, that the time crunch that forced otherwise good folks to miss the mark. It's not that these seminaries are horrible people. It's not that they were bad. It's not that those 90% or 55% or 37% ought to be kicked out of, out of seminaries, shouldn't be ministers in churches. It's not that they were bad, bad, they were bad people. It was that they were forced uh, by time constraints. Otherwise, uh, good people were forced to walk by. I wonder if Jesus had this in mind when he used specifically the priest and the Levite in his parable concerning time. The priest would have been would have been very very busy. He would have had a lot of important things to do. The 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 Levite would have been uh, uh, would have been very busy as well, uh, going about all the all the important um, uh, things to do. In the, in the life of the temple. They, they had to get from one place to another. They had lots of stuff to do. And, and for, them, uh, for them, and we'll talk about this in, in a few minutes, but for them uh, to, to stop and to, to touch this person, maybe, maybe this person was dead. Presumably this person was bleeding. And, and for them to get involved with that, for them to touch this person, to be made ritually unclean, would cost them huge amounts of time because they would have to go back and they would have to cleanse themselves. They would have to go through all these rituals to, to, to uh, uh, go back and perform the functions that they were on their way to perform. So quite possibly time is, is an issue for the priest and the Levite. They don't have time to help this person and then to meet all the ritual uh, 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 things that they have to do to, to become clean again, to perform their duties. And so it's easier just to walk by. Perhaps the thing that made them almost Samaritans was they were too busy. Unfortunately, that makes them too busy to be a good neighbor. In turn, the busyness of their lives, ironically, the, their, their busyness with their religion made them too busy to love a neighbor as themselves. They almost, almost got but they were too busy to love their neighbor. We're busy people too. We're busy people with, with our work. We're, we're busy people with our social obligations. We're busy people with our families. We're, we're even busy people with our church functions. We, we have all this stuff that goes on in our lives, all these things that are so important to us, and, and, and it, it makes us busy. Over the last few weeks, we've thought about prayer and discipleship and how God heals us and prepares us to be in ministry to the least and the last and the lost. We have been talking about how God prepares us essentially 
to love our neighbor as ourselves as we go out and become people who are healing and restorative in our communities. But sometimes we get so busy that we miss the opportunity to be good Samaritans. We come close, but we walk on and we walk by and we miss the mark. We just don't have the time. Let me remind you of the initial question again. The initial question of, of the expert in the law is, how do I have eternal life? And Jesus says, love God with all your heart, your mind, your body, and your soul, and love your neighbor. I wonder what that implication is to almost love one's neighbor. It's time for some of us to reevaluate where our time is best spent. It's time for some of us to not be almost good Samaritans anymore. But time isn't the only thing. I remember uh, the day that I interviewed with the, the Board of Ordained Ministry in the Wisconsin Conference. I was sitting there at a table. And there were there were uh, pastors. There were there were also uh, district superintendents. There was actually there was even a, a, a video feed. I had probably Skype with a, with another district su superintendent who couldn't be in that room at the same time. And and there was a series of of, of questions that were asked of me, and I and I needed to answer. Uh, one of which stands out in my mind. I, I, I'm not going to ever forget this. Um, one of the district superintendents presented uh, me with a simple question. He asked me this. He asked me what theologian most influenced my theological viewpoints and me personally as a Christian. Theologians! Man, that's that's uh, uh that's that's my deal, right? You know, you go go look at my diploma on the, on, in the parentheses. <laughs> it says it says theological studies. Man, that's that's what I'm into. I, I I like theology. I like to think about this, and that's my thing. And so I expounded, and man, I, I boy, I I really wanted to look good, and and I knew I had all this fresh stuff in my mind, and I expounded on Augustine and Irenaeus. And, and the Cappadocian fathers, and, and, and Kierkegaard, and Bonhoeffer, and C.S. Lewis, and, and Boltman, and, and Pannenberg, and, and how it was. Boy, boy, from, from, from way, way back in history all the way up to the 20th century. And, and I could talk about all those people, and I was, I was really just on a roll. I went on and on and on and on and on until finally, in a moment of time, it just hit me. This, 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 this idea just, just hit me in the, in the front of my head. And I looked at the DS and, and the one who had asked me the question, and I just kind of stopped. I wonder if he knew what I was thinking. Because when I stopped, I looked at him, and he looked at me, and I started to smile, and he started to smile. And at the same time, before I could say anything, he simply said to me, What about Jesus? Hmm. I just groaned and I started to laugh because that was what had caused me to come to a stop. It hit me as I was expounding all the great theologians that I had ever studied and that had been influential in my life. It hit me that the most influential uh, theologian, the most influential uh, uh, a person who shaped me, who shaped my relationship with God, wasn't any of those people that was fundamentally and foundationally uh, Jesus Christ. In a rush to focus on everything that I knew, in, in, in a rush to show how smart I was, in a rush to talk about those who influenced religion, I forgot the most important part. I forgot. I forgot Jesus. Hmm. I wonder if Jesus didn't use for the characters in his parable these religious folks, because after all, he was talking to an expert in the law. Here on the road was a bleeding, maybe dead person. As I said before, neither priest or Levite would want to go near this person because of religious prohibitions. 
their religion, the things that they said that they believed, the things that they said they had to adhere to, caused them to, to, to find a, a, or to have a need to go past this, this uh, person on the, on the ground. They missed being the Good Samaritan because they were so religious. Maybe Jesus is giving a subtle message here to this uh, expert in the law about relationship and love of neighbor that is more important than just being religious. Maybe this is an emphasis about relationship over religiosity. 37% of the people in the Good Samaritan experiment that I talked about walked past the person slumped in the doorway even though they were early. And they had ample time to stop. I don't know for sure. I don't know any of those people. But I wonder to myself, maybe uh, were some of them so engrossed in a topic and, and the story that they were about to present about the Good Samaritan that they missed an opportunity to be the Good Samaritan? We get so caught up in the little insignificant stuff of the church. We get caught up in who came to the potluck and who helped in the kitchen and who is on such and such committee and who isn't. We worry about what versions of the Bible that we read, we, which prayers we say. We, we worry about what stuff uh, we do in worship and what gets announced and what doesn't get announced. We get so caught up in being religious that we miss being in relationship. We almost are the good Samaritan. Wesley described a person uh, who is an almost Christian. In, on, on July 25, 1741, he delivered a sermon at St. Mary's Chapel at Oxford. He was preaching to seminarians and professors, a very prestigious seminary, a place that educated the Anglican priests. The title of his sermon on July 25th, 1741 was The Almost Christian. Wesley, in his sermon, described a person who is morally upstanding according to worldly standards. Someone who, who has good character, we might say, today. He talked of a person who is without fault in all that he does according to the gospel, according to, to what the Bible says. Uh, he does everything that he's supposed to, to do as far as being a good, up, upstanding person who, who uh, uh, follows the, the words of the gospel. Someone even who prays, someone who goes to church, someone who leads in worship. Wesley described this person who does all of these things, someone who has all the trappings of religion, and then called that person an almost Christian. Man, it was a good person. This person does all this stuff, goes to church, prays, even, even, even tries to lead other people to the church, to, to the Bible, and all those things. And, and Wesley says they're almost a Christian. Boy, I tell you what. If you, if you want to look at that, uh, look at that sermon, it is, uh, it's on the, the United Methodist uh, UMC.org website. It is... Uh, Wesley's standard sermon number two, the almost Christian. And you read what, what Wesley says, how he describes that almost Christian. And, and I would say to you today that we look around and we say, man, I'm not even an almost Christian. <laughs> That's pretty high standard. Then Wesley talks from there about what, what makes someone go from being an, an almost Christian to something that he calls an altogether Christian. And he explains what Jesus explained here in our parable concerning a love for God and a love for neighbor. Let me, let me read from Wesley's sermon. The second thing implied in being altogether a Christian is the love of our neighbor. For thus said our Lord in the following words, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. If any man, if any man ask, Who is my neighbor? We reply, every man in the world, every child of his who is the father of the spirits of all flesh. Nor, we, nor may we in any wise accept our enemies or the enemies of God and their own souls. 
But every Christian loveth these also as himself. Yea, as Christ loved us. He that would more fully understand what manner of love this is may consider St. Paul's description of it. It is long-suffering and kind. It envieth not. It is not rash or hasty in judging. It is not puffed up, but maketh him that loves the least the servant of all. Love doth not behave itself unseemly, but becometh all things to all men. She seeketh not her own, but only the good of others, that they may be saved. Love is not provoked. It casteth out wrath, which he who hath wrath is wanting in love. It thinketh no evil. It rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in truth. It covereth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, and endureth all things. Man. <laughs> How many of us can relate to the busyness of life? Leading us to step over the broken people that we meet. Many can really see, when we look honestly at ourselves, how religiosity leads us away from really loving our neighbor. And by neighbor, I again don't mean just physical neighbors. I mean all of God's children, even those that we consider to be enemies. You can relate to that. In the end, what most often brings us to the place of being almost Samaritans is not whether we relate to the priest or not whether we relate to the Levite or not even whether we relate to the Samaritan. It is that we cannot relate to the man beaten and left for dead. We cannot relate to the reality of that person laying in the ditch. We can't relate to the, to the reality of that person in the doorway slumped over, moaning and coughing loudly. We can't realize that we are, because of sin, that beaten, bleeding, almost dead in our transgressions person who is laying there on the ground. And that eternal life and salvation come through not the Good Samaritan, but through the incredible love, the graceful love of, of another. The graceful, sacrificial love of the greatest of good Samaritans. Romans and Jews did not kill Jesus. He gave up his life as a sacrifice, a fulfillment of prophecy, to break the hold of sin and death for eternity, so you might live. He was bruised and beaten, pierced for our transgressions, mocked and humiliated, rejected by man and God. A fulfillment of prophecy for eternity, so you might live. On that cross he hung, with one last breath he gave up his life, a fulfillment of prophecy, so you might live. Death could not hold him and sin could not bind him. He rose victorious on the third day as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Eternal Savior and Righteous Lamb, Everlasting Father, Blessed Redeemer, Resurrection and Life. A fulfillment of prophecy for eternity so you might live. And when He returns, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Brothers and sisters, it is only when we begin to understand what Jesus has done for us it is only when we begin to understand how much Jesus gave for us. It is only when we begin to understand how much we did not deserve what God did when God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. 
It's only when we begin to truly realize the depth of love that was given to us unconditionally as we lay bleeding and beaten in our own transgressions with no hope. It's only when we understand that that's who we are. That's who we relate to. And then the depth of love that was given to us to save us from that. It's only then that we can truly realize the depth of love that we are called to have for our neighbor. Man. Jesus can love me that much. Why can't I love my neighbor? If Jesus can love me that much, why am I only an almost good Samaritan? Let us love then. In the way that is not almost. In the way that, that, that brings us back to the original question in which uh, the, the, the expert on the law asked Jesus, How may I inherit eternal life? Let's not almost get it. Let's not be almost Christians. Let us love the way Christ is loved and be all together. All together good Samaritans. All together Christians.